Hey everybody, welcome to Sarah Kuro Interviews. I am catching up with a very old dear friend of mine, Jacob Ploy. He has started something called Opus 143 and about five minutes ago I didn't know what that was and as he was going to get his coffee in his beautiful hipstery green cup, I quickly had a look at that and it is absolutely beautiful. Jacob, you can now call yourself a composer. Welcome to my show. Thank you, Sarah. Awesome to see you. So anyone who knows Jacob from the old days will know that he was a member of the Australian Youth Orchestra. Anyone who is of our age, which is approaching 50 now, I believe. Um, And I want to talk to you today about so many things. So let's get started with, let's go back to when we were kids and how cool we thought Europe was when it first went on our European tour. Go. It was so much fun. We were allowed to go. We were all big kids so we could sort of do what we wanted finally in the world and we arrived here in two huge buses didn't we and it was just like one big trip going all over europe playing fantastic concerts with really awesome musicians in all sorts of places and just being on fire everywhere really it was just on like fire everywhere and you just didn't stop we were young too were we 19 20 how, how old were we uh, something like that yeah around there you remember, or something, wasn't it? I remember those remember. double-decker buses which had the underneath room that we all played yeah. cards and smoked and that was just yeah. totally normal? That was normal. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, it's ridiculous. You can't smoke on the on the trains anymore over here. No, no, you can't you know, smoke anywhere. Not, yeah. not oh, in so a cafe anymore. Talk to me. You're in, you're in Amsterdam now. I'm in Amsterdam. How long have I've you been there? Left. Yeah. 20 years, approximately. Oh. Wow. Where has 20 years gone? <laughs> I know. <laughs> so we also lived um, in the same house as each other in Tasmania, didn't we? It was oh, so incredible. Hill Street. Yeah, Hill Street. And and you, I remember being really irritated with you a lot because you were really free, <laughs> free spirit and I wasn't. I was quite repressed and by the law and by the book and you always wanted to do crazy things like um, have me sit on the front of the bike and that sort of thing really traumatizes me because it's like, no, 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 I, I don't want to get on the front of your bike. Something might happen. And you're always like such a free spirit. I'm amazed you did classical music at all. So talk to me about how classical music sort of grated with your <laughs> free spirit personality. <laughs> um, I think free spirit personality was a reaction to lots of things. So the classical music is probably the core of who I am. Am because oh, I just yeah. learned it from really, really the beginning. And then through the discipline and the just the discipline, I guess, and all the focus needed to create beauty and surprise and everything you do in playing classical music, there had to be something to balance it. Mm-hmm. So you can't just get up at 5.30 in the morning and then practice an hour and a half before school and then go and do whatever rehearsals you have and then go after school to do something and then keep going until something's got to break so you've got to have something else and i didn't really have sport i didn't really have painting i didn't have anything else so i Mm. guess it was just like what else is there Mm -hmm. you know and i guess the more i've the more i got into music so i guess when we're in tasmania together and i was doing conservatorium and all that sort of stuff i'd basically already been to adelaide in the conservatorium now that didn't really work out so at a certain point it was like probably you have to go somewhere else so jacob so i ended up you know, looking around and going down to Tassie to, to hang out with Sadifka. And there I took a year off studying, started working with the orchestra and had a great time there. And then I just ran into the world of artists and art and art. That's how we had Benjamins and we had the whole Art Kills thing, that whole house we used to live in together. Yep. Was Celia, was it? Yep, Celia. Yep. Yeah, and Matt. And it yep. was just like... You know, it was so free that one day it all just burnt down, didn't it? Yeah, it, was it literally. So much freedom, it literally burnt. We the burnt ground. our own house down. And look, in front of everyone, in front of the whole world, publicly, I want to apologise to you because I think I was the one responsible for that. I I thought the fire was gone and finished, and I didn't cover it, and I was the last one to bed. So it's absolutely my responsibility, and it's plagued me ever since. So here in front of everybody, in front of the interwebs audience, I apologize for burning down 19 Hill Street, Jacob. I'm so sorry. You are forgiven from the universe. You've done so many awesome things since that. 
and we all got out alive. Well, you did. We we nearly didn't. You we had did. to jump jump out the window. Remember? Yeah, I had my underwear and my violin was all I could take. Really? Yeah, I had a basket jump of dirty the washing the and a, and my violin. <laughs> that was it. And everything else was destroyed. Yeah, it was quite traumatizing though. There. Yeah. Yeah. You know, how how did? Actually, let's let's talk about how that life changing experience did it affect you at all as far as well anything at all did, or did you just uh go back to normal how how did that house fire affect you you've forgotten about it <laughs> yeah well i know there was a deep scar or so, there's something emotionally weirdly powerful about that whole experience especially like sort of realizing how close you were yep and also, the complete feeling of being completely lost afterwards, having no place to live. Yeah. Trying to find somewhere, going from one place to the other, ending up in weirdos' houses. I remember. Going, oh my God, what am I doing here? Yeah. And that, and then eventually ending up moving next door with the neighbours, which was like, how yeah. could that happen? Mm. Which was also completely brilliant. Mm. But, um, yeah, I guess at the time it would have had a big impact. Thinking about it now, I don't particularly think it had any it, it didn't didn't form me in any way. I think plenty of other things formed me more, but it was definitely uh, a deep mm. a deep moment of like, yeah. what do you have, and what don't you have, and, and how lucky. Oh, the luck wasn't there. It was just kind of mm. empty weirdness. Yeah, it was, actually. wasn't it? Like, I it can't really imagine was. what it would be like. Yeah. Imagine if you really lost everything in a you know in Australia with house yeah. fires, bushfires, yeah. fires, which my parents live with all the time. Mm. And I got to live with it mm. from over here mm. and go, you know, you see them as bushfire season comes on. You see it in their, their body language, just sort of approaching mm. Mm. where you're talking to them yep. for, you know, five or six months a year. Yep. And finally it's over and they relax a little bit. But, yeah, I, it's um, yeah. we live with it in Australia. It's nature, isn't it? And the yeah, elements. it's a brutal like, country. Um, what kind of feelings do you have now that you don't live in Australia is this anything you miss or are there things that you're really glad that you don't have to let's talk about sort of culturally I mean you're pretty Australian to me but actually you've been living there for 20 years so let's go there what what are those sort of differences biggest difference is probably a difference in myself as soon as I got here I turned off the radio and I turned off media completely oh. so I got here and I couldn't speak the language and I was only going to stay for a year to see what was going to happen. I'd got a bunch of money from the Harry Potter, no, was it Ian Potter? <laughs> um, fun to go and study and meet composers and go off and compete in a in a contemporary music competition. Um, so I had six months of money and time, which you know when we were working in ACO and all that no other money. stuff, just on 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 no time to do anything. Yep. And of course, you still had to because you had to find out who you were going, you know, had to balance mm. out your life with other stuff. But I came in, had time and money, and I didn't know the language, and it was great because it was silent. If I look, if I sat in the bus, I couldn't understand what bullshit people were talking about. Mm. Couldn't read the signs. I could actually just be with myself, and that was, mm. like, the most awesome thing. And after, I think, two or three years, I had to learn, I realised I was staying and had to learn the language, but I, I turned off the television completely, and I turned off media completely, so I don't know what's going on in politics here. I don't know what's going on in politics in the world. I don't. I don't know anything. Um, you know, you sort of get it from talking to people. Yep. If I want to know what's going on, I talk to my neighbours. Um, the funniest thing is now, if I talk to my parents, I, I call them up. I'll hear the radio in the background, and I'll hear the same idiots fighting about the same stuff, and I hear my parents complaining about the same, you know, way the world is. And I say, but you can turn it off too. You don't have to do it. So for me, that was the biggest difference. So becoming ignorant, but becoming more connected with everything around me. And that was for me really a great thing. And through that, I think another difference is, um, well, something I discovered here was the underground side of things. So in Australia, we had, you know, the highbrow and everything we were doing and the culture and fighting for that all the time. and. I managed to find the electric string quartet with Electra and do compositions and composing and improvising, but it was still always trying to be part of the big, yep. the big boys, the big girls' world. Mm -hmm. And yeah, mm. I came over here and the whole city was still one great big messy squat, pretty much. The 80s, it was saved by the squatters. 
by the time I got here in the beginning of the year 2000, or the end of the two, 2000, it was 50, you know, 51, well, much less than 50, 50, but it was still, you know, every week you could go and squat a building. It had been empty for more than a year. And there were these people squatting these massive buildings and you'd turn up and it would be like freedom. Like these people needed someone to live and they were, but every time they came there, they created something. They created a kitchen for the neighborhood, they created a place for people to come to perform, they created a cinema, they created a, a, an area where people could express themselves and you could use it and you could, you could connect to a different community and you could try things out that you normally couldn't try out without having to hire a hall and make all publicity and have a story about what you were doing. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to do that anymore. So you could come to this place where people were just on the fringes, trying stuff out, using whatever they could find to make things and create things. And in that world was also a subculture that also managed to turn that into small festivals and places where more of these subcultures around Europe got together to express themselves. And so instead of having the danger of fire that we had in, in Australia, we had this one performance, which was a building with four sides and we had four different elements. And for example, the side that was fire, it was three stories high and they were pouring liquid lava over the edge and <gasps> this crazy, oh, I don't know what they were, and banging with these massive sticks and the fires going up and they had a fire organ. And like the people were literally standing one parking space away from a car with nobody, with no wire, no nothing. It was just like common sense tells you how far you had to be. And you had, you know, 15 minutes to watch this thing and move to the other side. And then you had the, another element of water and air and everything. So it was like, yeah, you, you there's no people sort of break the rules but in a sensible way here and yeah. they were have been given the the, uh, the room to do that where i didn't get to experience that very much in australia i'm sure it's there I no it's not you're right here in my it's, life, no it's, it's not here you're absolutely right here is towards the nanny state ideologies of oh well we want people to ride more bikes so we're going to um make more bike lanes that we don't need mm -hmm. cut off traffic lanes not make the public transport better so people are still driving a lot and the same amount of bikes are on the road so now there's gridlock in all of these um suburbs because the idea the intention is oh we want more people to ride bikes so we're just going to mm -hmm. make the roads worse for, for the drivers and hopefully magically people will now get on their bikes. So we've got these sort of people in positions where they think they're doing society a favor, but they're actually just micromanaging and controlling in a really, really terrifying way, which causes a lot of chaos and a lot of rage. There's a lot of rage yeah, in this con country now, much more than when we were kids. We, we used to have quite a good time actually. But this goes with what you're saying about media. Our media is so black and white. It's so heavily controlled by one side that mm -hmm. everything we get fed, if we believe it, our worldview is nothing but depression and anxiety. And I'm like you, Jacob, I don't watch the news. I'm not ashamed to say it, everyone. Goodness. You can judge me. I don't care. Like you say, I get it from people who will talk. Communities talk, societies talk. Yes. There's information to find out. A conversation is a much quicker way of having to sift through all the lies that we're being fed. So yeah. Australia is like this tiny little bubble of uh, misinformation. And so you turning off that radio, this is the, one of the most enlightened things that I actually think I've heard for a really long time. So I totally get it, totally. It's brilliant. I, love yeah. it. I can't live without it. And I talk to my neighbours. Yep, you know, yep, yep. I know what's going on in their lives as well. Yeah. You know, and would I, yeah, I often think we also, because my, my wife comes from Brisbane and I <laughs> met her here, so you'd never find her. I know, you were talking about how far away <laughs> and we were, we, we how far away we thought each other were, and then you come all the way over here and you end up meeting somebody. And then, for the fact that that's a small place, you know, I think we're at the same art exhibition opening somewhere looking for the bar for free alcohol that we do. <laughs> and then, um, <laughs> you know, and then suddenly we sort of, the accent sort of goes like, oh, blah, blah, blah. and then, yeah, we just sort of met each other and, and never left each other's side from that point. But wow. um, how did I get there? 
Oh, it doesn't matter. It's I've romantic. It she just came you know, into your mind and you just had to talk about it. Is she yes, a mu- exactly. musician? Is she a musician as, no, as well? No, she's not. Oh, it's hallelujah. another really interesting thing. You sort of meet somebody who's not a musician mm. and a whole other world opens up to you. Yep. So she yep. does branding and marketing and communications, which in the beginning I used to tell people was just, um, you know, selling people shit they don't need, that <laughs> Spin, they don't really yeah. want. Yep. You know, and then eventually once I you know, got to know her and spent lots of years living with her, I realised it's so much more mm. and there's so many great stories to tell and you mm. can choose who you want to sell to and what you want to sell. Mm. And her whole life is based on finding the right path for her to tell the right story about what, how she thinks the world should be and not just going for quick money and doing what you need to do to earn money. So maybe you start in the beginning. I'm sure we've all done gigs that we think in Oh, yeah. <laughs> Geez, I wish I hadn't have done that. Yeah, you know? pro- prostituting yourself for money, absolutely. Exactly. Yep. And then finally you reach this point where you get some artistic integrity and belief in yourself and you knowing that you will survive no matter yes, what. Yes, absolutely. And you start making real informed choices yep. and make the world a better place. Yes. And, you know, I've learned that too. And I've learned that, that creativity is in, is in so many things. And, um, yeah, so she's got a creative behoop, a creative job. Hmm. And yeah, I couldn't quite work out what creativity was in the beginning, but now I realise it's 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 in everything and in so many things you can do. Yeah, even even to the point where um, if you if you've got a seemingly restrictive activity in your life, like I, I play with Melbourne Symphony, and that's quite re- restrictive because you don't choose any of the repertoire, you don't you don't choose any of it. You just have to turn up, sit down. You know what it's like to play in a symphony mm-hmm. orchestra. There's no creativity as as we would imagine creativity is, but you can really pride yourself in making in being a tiny little cog in that big machine and then what what ends up coming out is as you said right at the beginning of this talk what what is it that makes it come to life you know it's 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 incredible what happens when you just do your tiny part in a humble way that all of a sudden a Mahler symphony comes out it, mm-hmm. it's it's just incredible you can pride yourself on that and even though it's not creative in a in a traditional sense it's still really worth doing. And that's what's happened to me. I've become less uh, anti-establishment as I get older because what, what, what I do is worth doing because it's preserving something and it shouldn't just die because uh, it's not Absolutely. creative. It can still be there and it can still bring the most amazing sensations to, to, to people and it creates a lot of jobs as well. I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people um, working for my uh, old fashioned industry. But at yes, the same time, yeah. I use my money to support people like you, people who have a creative energy and who create, literally create new works. So, you, since I just quickly spied on your website before, let's talk about that. How did this all happen? When did you decide you were going to be a composer, Jacob? Oh, I don't like the word composer, but okay, it's been labeled. Well, the label's been okay, what, I found what, it myself. What word? What word do you use then? No, I don't have a good word. No, I just there's no good word for it. It is what it is. In don't be am, insecure about calling yourself a composer. It's completely fine. I say it's all fine. those amazing composers. I know. It's, what this, there's so many ways you can go into this. Just to touch on the composer thing. Yep. Why please. Not? We grew up with this whole. Yep. You know, great composers yep. thing and all the great works and all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. But then the further you go, you realise, okay, and then lots of people wrote themselves cadenzas and then you have other people who wrote, you know, little bits of music for their children and mm. all that sort of stuff. And then, so that's the sort of classical music side of thing. And then yeah. at some point in life, pop music turns up into your life and you start playing in, you know, in the studio for people, and, yep. you know, and they're like, wow, that sounds amazing. Yeah. Oh, and you're like, okay, that's just what I do with my eyes shut when I'm asleep. No, no, no. And then eventually you realise you listen more to what they're doing and you think, yeah. oh, it's so simple. And then the more you realise they're just telling a story in a short period of time and it's a quite a nice format. Yeah. You think, like, oh, actually, if I'm going to say something, maybe I can say it yep. in a simple way. And for me, let's just try to get into this 143 thing. Um, that's where that was born and that was born out of necessity. So we all have corona in our lives. Mm. And at a certain point, I had no concerts, no work, and my wife lost her job. Oh and oh, gosh, how are we going to make this all happen? Mm. And so I looked at what I could do, and I already had a whole business making uh, instruments with kids and, and, and doing that sort of stuff. But I realized that 
that wasn't going to be it. Mm -hmm. I was trying it out. And then I, I, I made a, um, a birthday present for my god goddaughter in, in Melbourne. And um, I put her, 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 her name started with the letter E. So I was like, all right. I just saw so I drew a treble clef and I whacked out a few lines and I just put an E on there. And I thought, okay, that's the first letter of her name. And then I put E, double M, another E, I, L, I, E. Oh, it's got two E's. And then I just moved the other letters of her name around on the, on the music uh, staff and made a little melody out of it. And then I thought, oh, that's nice. What am I going to do with it? And then my son was showing me how he wanted to become a YouTuber at that time. And he was like, oh, dad, dad, you should check this out. You can record yourself while you're playing on the iPad. You can do a screen recording. So he set it up and I started doodling on this thing. And yes. I didn't have a, a high tech thing yet. I was still using my finger and everything. Yep. And so I made this, and suddenly, like, you could see the E come to the life, and the M, and the M, and the I, and then it was yeah. like, oh, it, the sound of her name mm. came to life. And then I turned that into a little tune, I made a little diagram, and I sent it off to her. I didn't think anything else of it. It was just like a nice little present. Well, she loved it, and her parents loved it. She said, oh, look, look Lewis's birthday's in two weeks. Do you reckon you can make us another one? I was like, oh, all right. So I put Lewis on there, and I was like, L O U I S. There are no letters there. What am I going to do? With no, no letters from that, that sound. So I thought, well, okay, the I, I can move the dot on the I anywhere I like on the music stage. Mm -hmm. And the other ones, I'll make them till they sound good. So that was that one. Did that one. It also sounded nice. And then they asked for another one. And I was like, <laughs> okay. all right, I guess I'm going to have to do another one. So I started thinking more about how do you do this? Have I ever heard names in music before? What should I do? And then I remembered. Bach had done it, and you know, Shostakovich. Covid, yeah. which everybody knows. Yep. And you know, um, yeah. And I was like, okay, it has been done before. So I researched it a little bit more, oh. and I found out there was a, a there's a French version and a and a German version. And the French version is really simple. You just start with the letter A, you go all the way to G, and then when the alphabet goes further, you return back to the letter A, and you go through the alphabet again. Yep. So you can basically, it's like the white notes on the piano and you can keep going through anybody's name. You can sit mm -hmm. down and do that. So anyway, that's basically a bit of the, how, how you make things sound. But the reason I did it in the end was there were no concerts. There was nothing to practice for. There was kind of, there was no, when you play a concert, there's an end goal. You know, you have the moment, you perform, yep. there's applause, it's yep. finished. And you work on the next piece of music and, you, and that whole cycle was gone and there was no co mm. connection with an audience there was no talking to the audience after there was nothing and through doing this i would suddenly meet a person some now i do it with people i don't know at all and through communicating with them you find something about them you create the piece of music in a very simple way because you get the basis of their name and what you're going to do with it you learn a little bit of personal information then you create something every time it's new because i can't sit still and it can't always be the same and i can't repeat the same thing and then you record it and then you send it with the with the pitch to these people and you're waiting you don't know what the reaction is going to be so you have like this one old personal audience with somebody and then you get their you know you get their appreciation or whatever it is that it is and then they pass it on to the person they've made it for and sometimes it's for one person like for the birth of a child or something but sometimes it's like you know, it could be for a wedding anniversary. I've mm -hmm. done them for, and then you do it for two people. For example, for my, my parents who turned 50, I couldn't be there for, a, for their wedding anniversary. So I put my mum's name on the top, and my dad's name on the bottom, mm -hmm. and I had to make the two names fit together. And I sent it to them. But before I did that, I sent it to my whole family here. And they all listened, and they all sent photos that they thought could go with it. So I made the animation, and I made another one with all of the information. And I could connect the whole family by listening to the same piece of music. And there was like a concert that's going on mm. when people wanted to listen to it at the same time. And you, yeah, you get that whole package thing. So for me, it was a place to actually do what I needed to do to be artistically satisfied mm. and to get that moment of, oh, is it going to work? Is it not going to work? Because yeah, we need that. You need mm -hmm. that quetzpa, that fragile thing in order to survive, actually. Mm. You can't always just be the strong person who always gets it right. You have yeah. to... If you're going to connect right. with the emotion of the music or whatever, you, you've got to have something inside you that you can, that makes you, yeah, mm -hmm. think and wonder and 
and well, I can't find, quite find the words for no, it. No, I know now. exactly what you're but, saying. Um, you can't just you can't be static. If you're a creative you person, can't. you you have to constantly be changing and growing. I live with a very creative person, so I understand. Yeah. Um, so you what you've just described is a formula no different from what these people in the 19th century had. They were all writing to formulas according to the cultural traditions of their own countries. You can call yourself a composer because that's what you're doing. You have created your own form. Because after the 20th century, composers basically blew all of the rules out of the water. So as long as you have a method and a motive and a way of composing your music, that's recognizably you, you can do whatever you want. And of course you can call yourself a composer and especially how meaningful are all these beautiful things. I mean, you can see a lot of these pieces on your website, right? So if anyone wants to hear what they actually sound like, look up op143.com. Opus, O-P-U-S. Opus, O-P-U-S, 143.com. That's going to be underneath here. I'm going to put that up so everyone can see that. And do, do, do people ask you, like, so what happens if I wanted to commission you to write something for, say, my son's 18th birthday? Um, how does, how do, do we just get in touch through the website? Yeah, you first go to the website, have a look at the stuff that's on there, and then you fill in a question form, and I get the, the right information to extract your musical DNA. Mm. And then I look inside, and that could be anything from, I use a lot of, different tools to do that but basically you just fill in the information i take the information and then i create something and send it to you and then hopefully it's it's what you want Mm -hmm. and it's it's quite a simple thing there's a lot there's communication mostly through through emails Mm -hmm. because i do it all over the world um but if people want to give me a call and talk that's also fine Mm. um but yeah basically i can do it from quite simple simple information because i it's the restriction of things like what you said 20th century blue music out of the water yeah and my formula is now found the simple things i need to make something happen and i can get that from a name from a whole name i use the rhythm of somebody's name Mm. i use you know i might use your whole name and your nickname mixed together and, and the phonetic sound and rhythm of that i'll put inside and you won't know it's there but i know that's your name mm. and i know that's that's your theme and yeah so i basically it's just go to the website and have a look amazing mm. you know i've done as you probably know i've done a solo show for about 17 years and the main motivation is and, and i commission composers to to write yeah, between eight, awesome. and, eight and ten composers for each big show and that's not not the point the point is the big speech I make during the concert is don't buy some generic present for someone commission a piece of music a piece a piece of art a bit of pottery if you know someone in your circle who is a creative person even if it's like a crocheted thing whatever pay them to make something special instead of buying more stuff that just goes to landfill you know and a piece of music a digitally transmitted piece of music with images what could be more appropriate for now there is no landfill there but it's the most amazingly personal gesture that you could possibly pay for so not only are you making a a incredibly personal uh, gesture towards your loved one you're supporting a living composer and that's and that's yay that's yay all round i reckon i'm pretty proud of you actually i didn't know what you were going to do when you were younger you know speaking of chaos i I, I, I don't know. I, I didn't know what your path was going to be because you seemed not not that you'd give up on things, but but that there was something stopping you from really making a good go of classical music. And now I know what it is. Classical music just wasn't for you, you know, and that's just simple I as that. It still keeps me going. I mean, it's, I still, it's still my bread and butter at the end of the day. I, I've got to be honest about that. I, I stopped playing in orchestras when I came here. I did like couple of years i came here and did a chamber orchestra blah 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 that was all kind of what i've been doing there and then it all blew out of the water when i did that competition and found this uh, a contemporary music stri- uh, string quartet mm. we did that for like for years it's like seven years full on just like you commissioning every we had our own series and we commissioned composers every year working with the composers making their voice be heard mm-hmm. doing you know doing all that sort of stuff and then at the same time, that was the kind of a hardcore, oh, I'm really, you know, do, doing all the difficult stuff. And then you just have to play classical music to get back to your 
to what you know and how everything how everything works. And even now, you're like, even though I'm spending half my time in the studio, I'm still doing, you know, Brahms piano quartets and lots of chamber music all over the place to keep, I, I earn a bit of money with that. Yeah. But it's to keep the chops going and to keep me alive, actually. Okay, so, so it's I, the more... classical music couldn't leave me. I, I, it's a bit of a balance I needed. So I, you said it's, maybe it's a 50-50 thing. So, like, I have right. to have the classical thing because I've just done it every all the time, mm. but there's so much more. And that mm. so much more is what keeps me in balance. Mm. And, you know, that, that just keeps me satisfied, I guess. Speaking of balance, I always used to speculate about you too. I used to think about you a lot. I was probably one of the only girls in your life that didn't have a crush on you too. So it was good. <laughs> I had a nice objective, up-close view of you. And I always wondered, were you actually, with your free hippie sort of crazy behaviour, were you reacting against a conservative Adelaide sort of upbringing or, or that was just my own personal speculation was that I reckon that could I would never label it that way but I'd definitely say that it was part of it I mean mm. I grew up just yeah conservative Adelaide definitely I mean I had and I still have really loving beautiful parents who guided me in a, in a particular way and gave me lots of skills you know my father's actually a great musician and makes instruments and oh. If you look at my life, it's kind of a reflection of his, but he was a psychologist, as you know, for his bread and butter. And wow. I just went off and did all, all the creative stuff he never did professionally. I've gone off and turned into my, my bread and butter. Interesting. And so, but then I grew up in the hills and I did my, you know, did my practice and I got into that all that youth orchestra whole amazing thing that starts from when you're really little and goes through the state into the national, into the international, into the like, into mm. the real world. Mm. Got got into that and then conservatorians and all that sort of stuff. I mean, you can't get much more mainstream to describe. Yeah. To, you know, yeah. Rrr, 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 oh my God, you know, than, yeah. than that. And um, so it was definitely a reaction to all that stuff. Mm. And also art has always been a big part of my life and the expression of how other artists and other forms of art express themselves. And I never really had the hands-on ability to paint or to sculpt. I always mm -hmm. thought I was crap at this and couldn't do this, you know, because I could play the violin so well. Mm. The other things that didn't even get on my radar until, and then so you sort of live vicariously through others and you live with these other people and yeah. you surround yourself with these beautiful people and yeah. super talented people mm. and quite, you know, like uh, fragile people, you know, mm. cause to make art. I remember living with Benjamin Howe. Yeah. That insanely, yeah. The, the pain or the yeah. how far you have to go to express yourself yeah and that you see somebody else open themselves up yeah and you know you realize you do that in your art as well but you, it seems so much mm. more real when somebody else does it and explains their process you know mm. i mean you you know but you, i don't have to talk much more about it you know exactly what i mean when yeah. when we when we say that his name you know exactly what we're talking about mm. and then that sort of thing i had to find my way of of, of having that so that other side was always just learning how to how, how to express myself and then you express yeah and then once you've and you, yeah once you've got that then you can put it into your music i guess or not or realize it's, there's another place for it and music is more pure or more something else but that other part place is is also there mm. through your kids i mean you do you have children you yeah i've got one one uh one boy uh, he's nearly 18 but he's more a gangster so <laughs> a gangster yeah he, he he's part of an acting agency so he's you know he's he's a, he's a good actor but there's not that much work in australia for that so you know he has to look for other jobs and um mm -hmm. yeah but he's he's incredibly creative he was meticulous about pen drawing when he was growing up he would just for hours, copy. And I used to love watching him because it was the only time he was actually at peace. He Because he's quite crazy. He's like, Ugh. Yeah. But when he was drawing and he didn't want to draw with pencil, with colour, with paint, with crayons, anything, it was always a black pen. And he did the most unbelievably intricate drawings. And, and art for crazy people is so important because it does steady them in a way. It might also bring them more chaos somehow with all the associated activities that go with being an artist. But take Benjamin, may he yeah. rest in peace. Take Benjamin, for example, when he was in his trance-like states when he was painting, 
often he would paint in a mental institution actually some of the greatest things he's ever painted came out of his time when he committed himself he just mm -hmm. couldn't deal with the world anymore and just committed himself and 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 all of this stuff came out and to get up close to people like that as you say you know there were no shortage of artists in tasmania when we lived there and and yeah. and and that's not me I, you know me i'm conservative i'm practical i'm organized but mm -hmm. to be near those people you just somehow get affected by them in this great it's sort of like they shake up your own creative particles just by being next to the fire of them it's just spectacular so that i have to thank you for being in our little group back then because i think we all influenced each other in a really great way totally yeah sure did. yeah and actually you know i think it's just amazing that we're still going on and doing our thing and it's so awesome just to to see you again yeah like, you I can't too. actually wait to see you physically one day well, i don't know how that's ever going to happen but you know and the I doors don't get... are always open over here i if know Europe, putting a new oh, floor on i'm know, coming a space to stay I'm come coming. on over i don't get the feeling you've been out. beaten down by life i know a lot of my contemporaries if i see them after 20 years i feel like somehow they've been a bit crushed i don't think there's no hope for them i'm, I'm sure there's hope for it. sometimes it's just six weeks of going for a walk every day that gets mm -hmm. you back to to, to yeah. feeling better but covid really just was not great for a lot of people and I, i'm just happy it's that still not great, yeah right? no I mean, exa exactly exactly gone I, I don't believe it's going I, they say it's all opening up here everyone's had their jab and they, they finally got rid of the mouse mask for you know I, don't, I think in six months we're going to be back to square one again with it. But I'm still getting things cancelled in the summer. It's meant to be completely free. Yeah. We could still basically only play outside. Mm. Oh, I don't believe it's going to happen. Anyway, yeah. that's not going to well, bullshit. But it has been really heavy. Yeah. But I'm sure I try and reflect on other things. I to reflect on my grandparents who were refugees who ended up mm. in Australia. I think like their life, you know, yeah. they were yeah. getting shot there, jumping out of a out of a boat trying to escape. You know, and that, that, and they were Greek. You yep. know, we're not even talking about people who we're scared of now. Yeah, you know, it was just like part of our Australian community. These people have also had that stuff, and I think yep. like, okay, we're suffering a bit. Yeah, and we're all suffering as a planet together. So yep. somehow we're sharing something in all of that, and we have an yeah. understanding for each other. Yeah, it's definitely not nice if it happens. Mm. We're all stuck with it. Mm. But yeah, we're all. I don't know. It's. I'd rather this maybe than some other things that could happen to you in life. Yeah, completely. I, totally I, understand. I mean, it's definitely not nice, but it's... Um, no, don't yeah, be ashamed. Don't, don't, don't be apologetic. No, don't, don't be apologetic about that attitude because all that is is a mental exercise of comparing your situation to others who have it a lot worse. And, and if anything, that... Um, not that you want others to suffer, but it does put a little bit of perspective on it, doesn't it? And makes you feel, okay, well... I've got these good things going on and I can keep trying to do even more good things. So I didn't think you would turn into a spiritual guru, Jacob. I'm inspired oh, by this. Know. Well, you know, that's life. Wow. Spiritual guru. Have you, have you noticed um, the, the Dalai Lama's, the, the Dalai Lama's pyjamas? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they are made. You can be ready for anything. Oh my I can gosh. go into town. I've always got my mouse mask. These are from an awesome artist in Amsterdam called um, Kevin Power, and they're awesomely made. They can do anything with you, so you can, you're always ready for whatever you need. And kids love them. You know, you can completely disappear and just be like this blob somewhere in the room or at the train station where everyone else is walking around. You sort of disappear in a colourful kind of little blob in the corner. We are going to plug no. that that in in our in our comments here the, we're gonna the, the, plug the kevin Dali, power yeah, that's comment. for sure I'll, I'll write it down for you and yeah I, send me an email artist, i do the same thing as you if i have any money left over i do yep. the same yep i buy from people i support what i can yep. and sometimes it's not much huh? i if my kids they get pocket money and part of the money they have to put away for a rainy day part mm -hmm. of the money they have to can spend part of the money they have to give to a good a good you know good duel what's it called in english a um, good uh, cause uh, a good cause. Yep. Now, the yep. only good cause my son knew for years was a busker. Aww. You know, he always had money in his pocket. So if you saw a street musician, he'd stop and he'd, he'd want to borrow my money. Now he's got his own money to do yep. it. Yeah. But the other day we were at a market which opened up here and they were getting, he could buy, he could buy uh, fries made and the money from the fries would go to a, a humanitarian organization that, that 
that was an NGO and these people were going to get the money from, from, from the chips and, and give it to these people. And he was like, he got a double whammy of Aww. like, I get to get something yeah. and I'm, get, I'm helping somebody at the same time. And that, that is a really amazing exchange. And even when you give something to somebody like a busker, you don't realize that it actually is an exchange. Mm. You're not giving somebody to somebody. You're not. It's not just charity. Begging, mm. You know what mm. I mean? It's a yep. real exchange. And that exchange yep. is so meaningful. Even yep. if you don't realize it's happening. Yep. And that's Definitely. in everything we do. It yep. is an exchange. I mean, this yeah. is like we're talking now. It's also yep. an exchange. After yep. this, we're going to go back and think like, yeah. oh, I didn't ask this and I didn't ask that. And I wanted yep. that. But something's going to keep on going. The next yep. time we see each other, mm. we're going to be more connected and yep. And have different things to say to each other. Yeah, this yeah. for me is super meaningful. Yeah, like, absolutely. I really miss you, actually. Yeah, like, you too. I don't realise how much I miss you. Like, Until we say, I know. We would definitely see each other and I do know. stuff, and I was like, not a missed opportunity, but what an interesting life that two lives go in different ways. Yeah. How yeah. how would our lives be connected if we were in the same country? Yeah, like, yeah. What would yeah. we have done together? How would we how would we have crossed in yeah. all these years? I'm and now already. We you start this up. Yeah. You start up this crazy Sarah Curry interviews <laughs> and through that it turns up somewhere through Facebook oh evil Facebook they're in my life and then yeah. like wow yeah. hey and then I watch it and then I reach out to you and say hey yeah. let's catch up it's brilliant can you help me out or can you let's have a chat and you're like yeah let's yeah, do yeah. it and here Not- we are nothing's evil unless you use it for evil you know like i've loved facebook because i was there when it first started and it was completely different from what it is now yeah, but i just yeah, yeah, yeah. i just use it for this I, I just love showing the world how incredible all these people i know are so i have to thank you so much for giving your time to be with me and you know if you feel like doing a part two anytime let's do it well um Otherwise, and let's let's chat again. Let's do a part two one day. We'll talk out, work out what we're going to talk about, and yeah, yeah maybe we can do. Let's do some some. Let's do some more exchange. That would yeah, be yeah, cool. absolutely, Jacob. Oh my god, if I could hug so... you, I would. I know, right? Yes, oh my right god. <laughs> oh, okay. Until we meet again, I love you, Definitely. darling. Thank you, you too. so, so much. Lovely to see you.